Hello everyone and welcome to this lecture for P8105, a course on data science. This is the first in a collection of three videos on data wrangling, the process of importing and organizing data for analysis. This video in particular is going to focus on data import. I'm going to start by giving an introduction to the material using slides, and after that I'll demonstrate the material in a screencast. Feel free to skip around to the parts you find most useful. To get the most out of this video, as always, I encourage you to code along with me. All the material is available at p8105.com. Uh, and there are links in the description below. Fantastic, let's get started. All right, so I'm gonna talk about the process of data import. And before that, I'm gonna talk even more generally about the process of data wrangling. And the main thing that I wanna emphasize is that you're going to have to do some data wrangling. Um, data don't just sort of magically appear. They don't come in the form that you need. I can sort of count on one hand the number of times that in a, in a real data project and in, in something that isn't contrived that I have had um, data in the form that I actually needed them to be analyzed. And, and like, like I say, I can count that on one hand in the years that I've been doing data analysis, it happens approximately 0% of the time. This is a real part of doing data analysis and recognizing that it is an important part of doing data analysis. It's something that you are going to spend time doing and that it is um, something that you can practice, that you can use the best tools for, you can make this part of your job easier and more transparent. Um, all of that is important, um, but, but that's sort of something that I wanted to start out by saying is that data wrangling is, is a real thing that you're going to have to spend some time doing. Um, there's often a point of view or sometimes maybe a point of view that it would be better to simply be the person who is going to come in and do the data analysis that somebody else should be doing data wrangling that they should sort of do a lot of that the hard work of data manipulation um, the point that that i always bring up in response to that is if you expect somebody else to do the data wrangling that person is also going to be qualified to do the data modeling almost certainly or at the very least that person will be doing the data modeling qualified or not that's that's sort of what's going to end up happening so recognize and make peace with the fact that you're gonna to have to do some data wrangling and that that process is something that you can do well and you should spend time learning how to do well. I think, I think that's an important point. Now, what I'm talking about today in particular in the process of data wrangling is the data importation process. This is a figure that's come up in other videos. It comes from R for Data Science, uh, the, the textbook that's available online. Um, and this sort of gives an idea about the data analysis process as a whole, but sort of here, you always start with data import. And then there's tidying and maybe some transformation. These three I sort of think of as definitely things that are related to data wrangling. Um, some other data wrangling steps will happen in other places, but, but these three in particular are gonna be really critical for data wrangling. And of course, the first of those is just getting data from some form that exists on your computer, like a spreadsheet um, or Excel file, whatever it is you're going to be looking at, getting data from that form, from that file on your computer into R so that you can start doing other manipulations and other analyses is sort of the first step. We are in, in the collection of videos for this course in, in a lot of the time um, that you're going to be doing data analysis the goal that you should have in mind is a data table. This doesn't cover everything, but it covers so many things that, that it's really the only case that we're gonna be considering. Data tables, um, you could sort of think of as like the data rectangle that are holding the information that you have uh, uh, in, in the data set that you're looking at. And we're gonna formalize these principles a little bit more in a later video. Um, but we are going to focus on a setting where the data are not just in a rectangle, but they are also tidied up in some sense. And what I mean by that is you have a row in your data rectangle and each of those rows is going to give you some information on a subject and each column in your data set is going to be its own variable. And everything that's a subject is in a row and everything that's a, a variable is in its own dedicated column. And you put it all together and you get this sort of nicely formatted data rectangle. Um, that data rectangle, that data table might have um, different variable types. You might have a factor variable for something like race or ethnicity. You might have a numeric variable for something like um, age or BMI. You might have 
a logical variable, something that says whether or not some condition is true or false, there are going to be a lot of different kinds of things that show up. You might have text information that's just freehand notes about some, some something that goes on for that person. Right? There are going to be a lot of different kinds of information that get held in those different columns. And data tables, ideally, whatever, whatever structure you're using in R, should be able to hold each of those things. Um, we're not going to go into a lot of the details on this, but in R, what we're going to be using are called data frames. And so we'll refer to data frames pretty frequently. Those are the kinds of, um, the, in R, the data structure that is intended to hold a data set that looks like a rectangle and that can have different columns of different types. This looks sort of like a matrix, especially if everything is numeric, but it is in fact a very specific kind of list. And I'm saying these words not because I necessarily expect that they mean an awful lot to you right now, but that understanding that R is sort of organizing data in the background in a particular way will be helpful to you later on. And so in, in much, much later videos, we're going to talk more specifically about what a list is and what does it mean to have a data frame that's made up of, of something that looks like a list. For now, just sort of think of a data frame as a data rectangle where you've got rows that are subjects and columns that are variables. Um, what we're actually going to use is called a tibble. Um, and this was originally, uh, instead of being called an R a tibble, it was called a TBL underscore DF. And there was a question uh, on Twitter, how exactly should we pronounce this TBL underscore DF? And it's really tough because data frame just rolls off the tongue. And so what are, what are we gonna be going with? And so um, the responses to this ended up going with something like table diff, table diff, something like this. Um, Hadley Wickham, who sort of authors a lot of the stuff in the tidyverse, says, we're going to call this a tibble diff. Um, and there was some discussion over who exactly came up with it. And then eventually this was introduced in an R package, the tibble package. We sort of dropped that underscore DF in, in some cases, and we're just calling these tibbles now. Um, there is a, an R package sticker that goes along with the tibble package. And if you're looking at this and not real sure why this sticker goes along with tibbles, then you're going to have to understand uh, a little bit of history of sci-fi. This is coming from original Star Trek. There is an episode, The Trouble with Tribbles, and tibble sounds enough like tribble that that's where the inspiration for the sticker came from. So now that you know all of that, we can actually start talking about what a tibble is and why we're going to be using them. So data frames, like I say, I sort of started out by saying that data frames are how R is going to store the kind of information that we need, the data structure that's going to give us like rows and columns, and the columns can be different things. Data frames have been around for an awful long time, since R was introduced. And that data structure worked really well, especially when R was introduced. But now things are a little bit different. Data sets are a little bit more complicated. There are clearer principles for how you might want to operate on some of these data frames. There are some um, standard things that data frames do that tibbles do slightly differently. And so tibbles you can think of as a very small spin on a data frame. And I will often use those two words interchangeably. I will say tibble. Um, to when I mean tibble, and I'll say data frame, just assuming that that's going to be a tibble also. And the small differences are indeed very small, but they do introduce um, quite a, some, some benefits. And so we're going to be using tibbles. Most of the time, this is going to happen in the background. Just the tools that we use are going to introduce things as tibbles and assume we are using tibbles. And that's going to be, that's going to be everything that we need to worry about. Um, I want to give like some perspective on the data import process. And the, the first sort of point that I'm going to make is that the there's this 80-20 rule. And in this context, it means that 80% of your data import is going to be easy and take up like 20% of your time. And 20% of the data import cases are going to take up 80% of your data import time. Right? That's kind of how these things go. Um, what we're going to focus on, especially at the beginning, is how to deal with the easy cases so that the easy cases really are easy, so that they do become pretty routine. Um, we're going to use a few packages that make this 
um, more straightforward. In particular, the three packages that we're going to use are Reader, Haven, and Read Excel. Reader is sort of a standard issue if your data are coming in a CSV or a couple of related formats, that's what you can use. Haven offers safe haven to data sets that are actually stored in another format like SAS or SPSS, and Read Excel um, is here to help read in Excel and, and, and Excel SX files, whatever sort of the newest Excel format extension is. Um, I'm gonna make a couple of points. Some of these sort of exist nicely within the, the tidyverse and some of them are sort of more recent additions. All of them um, are going to have the same kinds of principles uh, encoded. They're gonna have roughly speaking the same user interfaces, which is gonna make things easy for you. And they're gonna have many of the same options, whether you're reading in data with Reader or Read Excel, you're gonna be able to specify a few options and that's gonna make your life easier. Um, each of these will by default make a guess at what kind of variable is stored within a column. It'll scan the rows and it'll say everything's a number. So I'm going to assume that these are all supposed to be numbers or it'll look and say these look like words. I'm going to assume that these should all be treated as characters, right? It'll, it'll make some guesses. Sometimes those guesses aren't right and you can force it to, to do something a little bit different. Um, you should, when you are reading in your data, look for those kinds of inconsistencies. Make sure that you understand what, um, whether a column is actually being parsed in the correct way, whether after import you look at it and you say, yep, the ages are now numbers and they're not like formatted as dates or something like this. Um, the other thing that I would like to encourage you to know at the outset always is to know what missing data looks like in the data set that you're looking at. And sometimes you know this in advance and sometimes it takes reading in a data set and understanding what you're looking at to identify what missing data looks like. And what I mean by that is mostly, ideally, people are going to hand you data sets in which missing data is either treated as an empty space or deliberately coded as an NA. Sometimes you're going to see a dot, a period, to indicate missingness. Sometimes you're going to see 999 or 88 for whatever reason um, will indicate that something was missing. So you just, you, you do sort of have to know what missing data looks like and you can take that into account in the data import process. Um, final point before we get started is just sort of a general suggestion, which is when you are working on a project and you have some option about what version of the data you're going to be working with, I encourage you to try to get the least processed version possible. And what the, the benefit of that is, is that you're going to, you will give yourself a little bit more work in terms of doing some amount of data transformation and doing some data wrangling, but that's often a good thing. What that means is it's giving you an opportunity to learn more about what data are actually in there, to make sure that you understand where variables are coming from and how they're supposed to be used. Um, it gives you some idea of what questions might be interesting in the data set, whether or not there are any issues in the data set, whether or not anything has been coded incorrectly. This gives you an opportunity to do a lot of that work that comes, to un that comes from working with the data, a lot of the, the understanding that comes from working with the data set. Um, the other thing is that I, you know, I, I encourage you when you are reading in data to use the same sort of principles of transparency and openness that we have talked about elsewhere. And the benefit of that is not that you are less likely to make mistakes than anybody else. The benefit is that if you are doing your data transformation in a very transparent way, you can show it to others and people will be able to check and say, okay, it, it looks like there's some coding mistake on your part, can, can we fix this and move on? Um, you're, again, the benefit is not that you are less likely to make mistakes, it's that those mistakes will be transparent and clear and hopefully easy to fix. Okay, uh, with that, fantastic. We're gonna switch to a screencast and get started with some code. All right, I'm gonna get started and write some code for data import, but before that, I've got a little bit of work to do to make sure that I am using the workflow and the tools that we have introduced elsewhere, especially in the collection of videos on building blocks. In particular, I'm gonna to go to GitHub and start a repository. I'm gonna copy that pro repository onto my machine and make sure that it's set up as an R project. I'm gonna make sure that I've got things like uh, our markdown templates and, and whatever else I need to use to make sure that I am keeping track of all of the work that I'm doing in a workflow that is clear and reproducible and transparent and sort of consistent with the, with the principles that we've described elsewhere. Um, so I'm gonna take a couple of minutes to do that and I encourage you to try to do the same things as well so that as you're coding along, you're getting practice in this at the same time. So I'm gonna start out by going to GitHub. I'm gonna create a new repository. Um, I'm going to call this repository data wrangling 
one. This is a public repository and I do want to add a readme file and I'm going to create this repository. All right, and now what I need to do to make sure that I have this repository on my own machine is say copy the URL here, going to code and copy, and then I'm going to open up our studio. And given that URL, given that thing that I copied from GitHub, I'm going to create a new project using version control, clone a Git project from a repository. I'm just going to copy and paste that repository URL. It's going to be called Data Wrangling 1, and I am, I'm just going to keep this on my desktop. Generally speaking, I would put this project somewhere that makes a little bit more sense, but for, for the sake of argument, let's just say I'm going to put this on my desktop and I'm going to create this project. Now, again, there's a lot of stuff that looks to be about the same. Um, this looks like our studio and all of this, but you see I've got this collection of files. I've got a git ignore file, which we've mentioned in the past. There is a data wrangling one R project and a readme that I'll update real quick. Um, this is the repository Tory, uh, for data wrangling one part of PE 8105. I'm going to save this and then just to make sure that everything is working, I'm going to commit um, all of this initial infrastructure. Okay, and then I'll push this to GitHub and it'll take a minute and I think everything is going to work. And, and just to make sure I'm going to double check, go to Safari, uh, rerun this and yeah I've got now the git ignore file I've got the data wrangling R project and I've updated my readme very briefly okay um, the next thing that I'm gonna do now is start getting some of the materials that I want to use for the data import process and in particular I'm gonna go to p8105.com the course website and we're talking about data wrangling and we're doing data import with reader and other things now what I'm going to download from the course website are the example data sets that I want to use today. They're linked to at the top right under here under example in this zip file. So I'm just going to download that pretty quickly. And then just because I don't want to start an R markdown file from scratch each and every time, I'm going to download a template for that as well. Now all of these, hopefully they're not all right behind my head. Um, I've got data wrangling here. I'm going to unzip this data import examples. Uh, and I'm going to copy this template into the Data Wrangling 1 repository. Um, as part of this, I think I will rename this from template to data import. Fantastic. Um, and then finally, I'm going to take this entire collection of data import examples and I'm going to put it into the Data Wrangling folder directory on my machine also. And, and just to keep things simple, um, I'm going to rename this entire folder data. Now, now, at this stage, I've got in this folder the README file, the data wrangling R project, a data wrangling, or sorry, a data import R markdown, and a folder containing looks like five data sets FAS litters, FAS pups, LOTR words, MLB 11, uh, and pulse, public pulse data, SAS7.BDAT. Right, the first two are CSVs. We'll talk a little bit more about that. The next two are Excel. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And the last one is SAS. Now, again, I'm going to come over here to Git, or sorry, to RStudio, and my Git client is saying this data import.rmd is new. I'm going to go ahead and commit that. And I've got this data folder. That's new. I'm going to click that button. It's going to say, look, you've got the data folder contains this file, this file, this file, this file, this file. I'm going to commit all of this. And I'm going to say uh, template and data sets or data import. Let's commit, close, and push. Okay, so I'm gonna open up um, my data import R&D. And now I'm just about ready to start working on things that have to do with actually doing data import. I'm gonna rename this real quickly. Let's call this data import. Um, and to make sure that this looks right on GitHub, I'm going to render this as a GitHub document and I'm going to delete an awful lot of the stuff that comes immediately after this. And what I'm going to do first is insert a code chunk using the keystrokes. And again, on my machine, it's option command I to insert a code chunk. The first thing that I'm going to do is load the tidyverse library. 
And the reason I'm going to load the tidyverse library is that the functions that we are going to use exist not in base R, but in the tidyverse library. And in particular, they, they exist um, in the reader package, highlighted right down here, R-E-D-R, reader, R-E, R-E-A-D-R, whatever, reader, right? Um, and reader is one of the packages that exists in this collection that is referred to as the tidyverse. We're gonna focus on this package today and we're gonna talk about some of the other ones in the next two video lectures. In particular, we're gonna talk about dplyr and tidyr. Uh, in, in the next couple of packages. But today we're, we're mostly focused on reader. Now again, I'm loading this package because it is um, it contains tools that I am going to use. I only have to load this once. I'm doing that at the beginning of this code, uh, of this document in a code chunk that I'm gonna call setup. Um, and, and now I'm, I'm getting closer to being able to read in some data. So let's, let's try this, read in some data. And I'm gonna knit this real quick just to make sure that everything works. Uh, it's able to load, it's able to knit. This is, it's helpful to check right at the outset that you can like knit the document that you're looking at. Okay, uh, what we have to do before talking about reading in data, before actually importing any data, we have to do at least a little bit of a digression about how we're going to read in some data. And the digression is important because uh, what we want to do is not go to file, open, read in data, something like this. If you're just clicking around on your machine, then what you're doing is in some sense not reproducible. What you're doing isn't writing some code that somebody else can look at and execute and do the same thing. If, you're, if your code is click on file and do this other thing, that's not really reproducible in the way that you want it to do. Now, what we need to be able to do is write some code that says read in this data set. And, and that's where this digression on paths becomes important because the path is the way that we are going to tell the computer, we are going to tell R, this is where this data set lives, right? We can't just say open uh, FAS underscore pups because our computer doesn't necessarily know where that is. We have to be very specific about where that comes from, right? Um, there are a couple of different ways that you can specify paths, and I'm going to tell you the first one and encourage you to never ever use it, and then I'm going to tell you the second one and assume that that's what you're going to use from here on out. The two ways that you can read in, or sorry, that you can supply paths are using absolute directions and using relative directions. Absolute directions are sort of like saying from the very first folder on your computer from like starting at hard drive and going into your user account and then going to your documents and going to your school folder and going to the class and going to the homework and whatever. If you start from that very first folder and you just say, go along this path, that's sort of absolute in the sense that it's like starting from that point and going to wherever it is you're looking at. A relative path, on the other hand, and, and you should be using relative paths, are sort of like saying, starting from where you are now, take this step and then this step, right? And it sort of assumes that the file that you're trying to get to is in some reasonable place, somewhere close to the, the directory that you're working in, but that's sort of the process that we're using, right? If you were going to give somebody directions, you wouldn't start by saying like, all right, well, you know, starting from the equator, you need to like go north until you hit Manhattan, and then you're gonna take a left, and then you're gonna do this and whatever. You're just gonna say, if you need to get to Target, go like down the street and then up three blocks. That's the way that you give directions in real life, and it's the way that you should give directions when you're working on your on your computer. Now, the a, a bit of the downside to this is that absolute paths are easier in the sense that you know sort of, um, that you can you can sort of just say, all right, if I know what that starting point is, then I can walk through and get there. Relative paths require that you know what is the starting point that I am that I am giving directions from. Where where am I giving directions from on my machine? Now, the benefit to using our projects, one benefit to using our projects that we've alluded to in the past is that inside of an R project, that's that's your starting point. That's where you're going to construct relative paths from is inside of this folder. So if I wanted, for example, to say, load in this FAS litter CSV and I needed to give a relative path, I would say starting from this folder, go into the data folder and then find this file. 
right? That's different from an absolute path that would say, starting from my hard drive, go into the users folder, go into Jeff Goldsmith, go into desktop, go into data wrangling one, go into data, go into FAS loaders, right? It's, it's a different way of constructing this, but the benefit of using our projects is that as long as everything that I need is sort of right within this same space, then it's easy enough to construct relative paths to go from this folder into data and over to here. Now, I will also point out that, that another benefit of using these relative paths is that the relative paths are stable in the sense that if I write this code using relative paths and anybody else downloads this code using relative paths, the relative paths will still work, right? That anybody who downloads this code will know using a relative path to read in this data set, start in the data folder, or sorry, start in the project folder, go into the data subdirectory and read in this file. That's gonna work whether I'm using this or somebody else. If I give an absolute path, that absolute path really only applies to my computer and anybody else it's gonna get broken. So um, this, this does take some time. I wanna be clear about this. Um, there is some information on the course website that gives some shorthand for constructing paths, but um, we're, we're gonna sort of see relative paths in action in the next little bit. Okay, so with that digression about paths now done and moving forward, assuming that everybody always knows what relative paths and absolute paths are and all of this is just like super, super transparent, what we're going to do next is actually try to read in a data set. So I'm going to read in the litters data set. Um, a little bit of background, this data set, FAS litters, and the uh, one that goes along with it, FAS underscore pups, comes from a study on fetal alcohol syndrome in which pregnant mice were given either alcohol or a control substance and the goal was to understand what happens in terms of the development neurodevelopment of the pups depending on the timing and the dosage of the alcohol um, that was that was given to the mothers while they were pregnant and so what we're reading in first has to do with like the number of litters sort of the the litter level data and, and we can take a look at that in just a second but our goal right now is let's just try to read this in so i am going to first create a code chunk and what i want to create is a litters data frame and the way that i'm going to do this is by using the read csv function again if i look over here i've got fas litters is a csv um, and i'm going to use read csv okay read csv is a function that exists in the reader package and if i wanted to i could double check what else is going on in here and we will do that in just a second but the first and most important thing that we have to tell read csv is what file do we want to read in now i'm going to give it a relative path that is very clear about the file that I want to read in. And I, I'm gonna start by saying a little dot that says from this starting point, from this folder, go into the data folder, and then from there, look at FAS litters csv and you can use tab auto completion in our studio to do this so again i've said starting here go into the data folder and go into fas litters.csv um, you don't have to have this i often do just because i'm sort of cranky like that um, the other thing that i'll point out is when you are constructing these paths special characters things like sometimes spaces or dollar signs or backslashes or whatever can mess up what is happening here and that's why I really encourage you as much as possible to use things like snake case and to avoid things like dollar signs when you are creating files on your own computer, directories, whatever it's gonna be. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna read in this CSV file. I'm gonna press enter and see what happens. Uh, it's giving me a little bit of information. Again, whatever this thing has done has been saved inside of litters df, and that's pretty fantastic. It's giving me some information here that we'll talk about a little bit later on. In particular, it says parsed with column specification. Again, as you are importing data, different column types can have different types. They can be numbers, they can be characters, they can be something else. And this is just giving information about that process. Now, a first step after I have read in the litters data frame almost always is to do some process to clean up the variable names. And, and what I'm gonna be clear about on this, let me open up first the spreadsheet and then we can talk a little bit about um, what's going on in here. So my spreadsheet is right over here. 
Um, and it's got things like group and litter number and GD zero weight, GD 18 weight, uh, pups are dead, special character at birth, pup survive. All of these are in sort of, certainly not in, in uh, snake case or something else that's easy to work with. Um, so what, I'm, what I often do as a step immediately after importing data is to do something like the following. And I'm, I'm gonna use this as a follow-up step um, and overwrite the original data set that I've read in right here. So I'm just gonna sort of rename this. I'm gonna use litters df, and I want to use some process that updates the, uh, the names of the variables that I'm interested in. And the way that I'm going to do this is using a certain function in a certain package. And the function that I'm going to use is the clean names function. Uh, and I want to apply this to my litters data set, but I need to specify which package this function is. It is neither built into R, it's not in base R, and it's also not in the tidyverse. And so if I just run this line of code, it's gonna say, we don't, we don't know what this function is. Now I can either load the package that this function is in by going up here to library and adding another library uh, call. That's not what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna use a, a sort of special notation in R that lets me say in the janitor package, use this function. So the, the structure that I'm using here is janitor and then two colons clean names. Um, again, I could load the janitor package. I'm choosing not to do that. Um, and the reason mostly that I'm choosing not to do that is this is the only function from the janitor package that I'm gonna be using right now. I don't want to load all of the other stuff. I don't want to worry about whatever overhead comes with that. I just wanna know this is the only function that I'm gonna be using, and this is, this is what I want to deal with. Um, I can take a look at what's in the litters data frame before doing this. Let me just sort of take a quick look and print this out. Again, we've got group. We've got these weird like quotations for something that it contains a space. If I wanted to deal with any of these, it'd be difficult. I've got the, gosh, the at sign here. I, that's really bothering me. And so what I'm going to do right here is just overwrite this data frame with a transformed version of that same data frame with cleaned up names. Um, and now I'm able to do at least a little bit of work to start taking a look at what's going on in my data set. So let's, let's sort of do that next. Uh, take a look at the data. All right, and at this point, um, just to sort of be clear about how everything is working, I'm gonna go ahead and knit and say that I want to commit these two things. Uh, import FAS litters, good enough. All right, what I wanna do next is take a look at the data set that I have in front of me. Now the, the first, the clearest way that I'm gonna do any of this looking at the data set that's in front of me is what I just did. I'm just gonna type litters df, and if I run this line of code, it's gonna print out that data set. And you'll notice it's giving some information, right? It's telling me first that this is a tibble. It's got 49 rows and eight columns, and it's only printing out the first 10 of these, which is kind of nice. It gives you a way to take a look. Is everything here about what I expected it to be? Um, my variable names, in contrast to this version where things are capitalized and there are spaces and special characters, everything has now been through that janitor clean names function has been converted to this snake case. So I can look at things like group and then litter underscore number. Um, the special character, uh, the at sign is here, pups dead. That's been sort of removed so we don't have to worry about it so much. And I've got, I've got this version of my data set here. There are some other things that you can do if you want to look at your data set. Um, so this is called printing in the console so that you can just see everything that's going in. There are some special functions that you can use. Uh, you can use head of the litters data set, which I rarely use because it's just sort of giving me uh, the first six rows and the difference between the first six and the first 10 is not all that useful. Alternatively, you can look at the tail of this. And this sometimes is useful in the sense that unless you have checked everything in your full data set to make sure that, that even the last rows are right, sometimes the last few rows have something weird going on. And so checking the tail of your data set to make sure that everything is structured the way that you want it to is, is a pretty good idea. Um, there are some other things that are a little bit more, uh, let's say, gimmicky. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the skimmer 
uh, skim function. So again, skim is the only function inside of the skimmer package that I'm going to use. So rather than using something like library skimmer, um, I don't want to do that. I'm just gonna access this one thing. And I'm gonna take a look at the litters, litters data frame. And the reason I say this is a little bit gimmicky is because it's just, it's something that is cool when you check it out and then you almost end up never use it in practice, right? But what's nice about this is that when you have character variables, again, group and litter number were called character variables. Um, and I'll, I'll revisit that in just a second. It tells you how many are missing, what are the min, what are the white spaces, what are things like this. When you get the numeric variables, it tells you how many are missing, what are the mean and standard deviations, and then the minimum 25th, 50th, 75th, and, and maximum values. Um, and it gives you a little, a nice little histogram right here printed out and you can see, all right, it looks like GD of birth is probably basically bimodal and GD zero weight is sort of spread out a little bit more, right? It's kind of handy, uh, but the truth is I, I don't use it an awful lot in practice. Um, another thing that I do use at least a little bit more frequently, actually frequently enough that um, it's a it's a pretty standard tool is the view function and i'm going to be clear i'm typing this in the console down here rather than putting it in a code chunk um, for the following reason if i do view litters df uh, and i run that line of code it's going to open up a new window and it's going to allow me to interact with that full data set and the reason that i did this in the console and not so much in a code chunk is because if I include a code chunk that, that um, tries to open up another window, that can, that can make our markdown, that can make the knitting process a little bit difficult. So I use this a fair bit, um, but I try to avoid putting it into a code chunk in an R markdown document. Now again, what we have here is in contrast to just printing the data set in the console, I've actually got the full data set here and I can scroll. If there were more columns, I could sort of scroll to the side and see what else is going on in here, all right? Um, the last thing that I want to touch on just a little bit before moving on to the next segment of this video is, again, just to sort of reiterate what has gone on um, with, with this data set. So I've printed it again here in the console, um, and what I see is that the group variable, again, this is a data frame with 49 rows and eight columns. That's sort of a first top line check that you might wanna do. And I've got things like group and litter number and GD zero weight and some of these other things. Um, group is a character variable in the sense that these are a mix of letters and numbers, right? They're being called CON7, CON8, and, and some other things. Each of these columns, instead of being a character, is called a double. And double is a particular kind of number in computer science and in programming. And so when you see something like double, think of it as, okay, that's a number, right? And, and what I'm seeing in each of these columns is actually numeric variables everywhere in the entire data set. And uh, the missing values in my original data set, things that look like NAs here have been coded as NAs over here, right? So, so, so far, everything is sort of looking good. Um, and this is, in fact, a, a, already a fairly useful table that we have in front of us. Um, and for completeness, again, I'm just going to knit and commit. Okay, uh, the next thing that I want to spend a couple of minutes on is not really any additional code, but is spending some time introducing the additional options to the read CSV function. And to do that, what I'm gonna open is the read CSV help file. Um, and it opens up over here and, it, and it's actually giving me help for both read CSV uh, read delim for other kinds of delimited files, read CSV and read TSV and some other things, right? Now, each of these, we're not gonna really get into too much. CSV stands for comma separated values. You can have tab separated values. You can have slash separated values. CSV comma separated values are the most common. And each of these functions is in some sense doing the same kind of a thing with just slightly different versions of what the input file is. 
And what I want to draw your attention to are a few different things. You can sort of specify what are the column names, what are the column types, what are the NA values, whether or not you need to skip any rows. Um, there are some other things in here that can in some cases be useful, um, but those are the main options into this function that I, that I want to be clear about. So let's look at uh, options to read CSV. Um, so here, for example, if I wanted to do litters df, and let's just take a look at read CSV, um, I'm going to use my relative path again, slash data slash FAS litters CSV. Um, and what I'm going to say next is let's skip 10 rows and take a look at what happens here. Um, I'm getting some additional information here, right? I'm getting a couple of warning messages. Uh, and it's doing a couple of things that are a little bit strange. So let's take a look at the data set that I have. Um, now this is 39 by eight rather than 49 by eight. I've skipped those first 10 rows and it's taken whatever that first column was, it's saying, I guess those are supposed to be variable names. Um, and that's not really what I, what I want in this case. So I could say call names equals false. And I can read this in again. And it's going to say, all right, you're not actually providing me with column names, so I'll just make up column names x1 through x8. Um, these two options are useful in cases where the CSV that has been provided to you is a little bit um, strangely structured. Either the first row is not columns or there is some blank information just in the first couple of rows, maybe um, a, a description of the data set sometimes gets included in the first few rows. What you can do here is either skip some of those rows or you can be, be clear that these are not, um, that the first row that you're interested in are not column names, that those are gonna come from somewhere else. Um, there are other options that I think are also useful, right? So if I specified NA is equal to a collection of things, I might be able to say an empty space and also the, the letters in A and also the value say 999. And what this would do is anytime it sees any of these three things, read CSV would know that that is supposed to be missing values. And you can, you can add other things here. Um, if for example, missing values are being stored as, as dots, great, right? Um, all of those are, are options. And then the last thing that I'm going to mention, and we're not gonna get into too much detail about this, is the column types. Um, column types, again, are going to be guessed by read CSV based on whatever information is included in that column. It's going to do its best. Very often it reads the first 1,000 rows and it says, based on these 1,000 rows, I think these are all numbers. Or based on these first 1,000 rows, I think you've got some characters floating around. You can be more explicit and say, I want this to be a character and this to be a character and this to be a character and this to be a double and this to be an integer and an integer, right? You can, you can be a little bit more explicit about that, um, but we're, we're not gonna worry too much about that. Um, so what I'm gonna say here is check out read CSV for more information. All right, always, we're gonna, we're gonna commit, right? Look at the help file. All right, what I wanna do next is shift gears a little bit away from CSVs. Again, CSVs are nice and handy. I've opened this in Excel. Um, it, it's sort of stored in a way that Excel can read pretty easily um, and it can be imported using read CSV. Um, in this, folder though, I've got a couple of other data sets. I've got one that is actually an Excel file. This is very different that Excel files behind the scenes, although Excel can open both, they are structured in ways that are very, very different. Um, and so the first thing that I'm gonna try to do is read in something that comes from an Excel file. Um, the other thing that I'm going to try to do is read in this public pulse data, which is in a SAS format. And so I need to use um, two other functions to other packages even to read in both of these two things. Um, so let's, let's get started on that. And let's start out with the Excel file and then we'll talk about the SAS file. Other file formats. Okay, uh, let's read in an Excel file. 
Um, I'm going to use the same kind of structure that I have used in other places in the sense that I'm going to create an MLB data set, an MLB data frame. And the way that I'm going to read this in is using the read Excel package. And there, there are, again, a couple of ways that I could do this. What I'm going to type is read Excel. So I'm, I'm going to, maybe in this case, I'm going to load the Excel, read Excel package. Um, and as a matter of personal taste, I'm gonna put that package up here at the top, right? And, and when I say this is a matter of personal taste, it mostly doesn't matter where you include this statement as long as you are using, um, you import, or sorry, you load this library before you try to use functions from this library. I like to put all of this at the top just so that in any time I or somebody else opens this up, it's immediately clear which packages are going to be used in the context of this, um, of this, uh, this R Markdown document. So here again, I'm loading the tidyverse and immediately after that I'm going to use, I'm going to load read Excel and let me make sure I actually load that package. And you may, you may sort of be wondering like, if I'm only going to be using one function from this package, why am I not using that other notation? Um, it turns out sometimes when you are using read Excel that there are additional helper functions that get used behind the scenes in a way that isn't always easy to predict. And so I'm just going to, I'm going to not worry too much about that and load the entire package. And now what I want to do is read in an Excel file. Now, again, this is not in the reader package, but it is structured in a way that is broadly similar to read CSV. And in particular, the first thing that I'm going to take a look at, or the, the first argument that I need to provide is the relative path to the file that I'm interested in. And so here I'm gonna just to be consistent, use dot slash data to say, starting from my project home folder, starting from wherever my project is, go into the data folder and I'll find this MLB XLS data set, okay? Um, and if I read this in, hopefully everything is going to work the way I want it to. Let me just double check MLB DF. Um, yeah, it looks, it looks about right. I've got team Texas Rangers. I've got runs. I've got at bats. I don't have to do anything in like janitor clean names because these names are already pretty clean. This might, I mean, this is somebody has taken some time to clean this up, but this is one of the few data sets that I would look at and be like, oh, this is, this is almost ready to do some analysis on, right? Um, it's giving me a tibble. There are 30 rows and 12 columns. It's only spitting out the first 10 of those, and it's saying there are 20 more rows. It's giving me team names, runs, at-bats. It looks pretty much like the data set that I have going on over here, okay? Um, I could, if I wanted to view the entire data set, uh, MLBDF, let's take a look, looks about right. And you can scroll through, it's got 30 entries, 12 columns, you can scroll side to side. Everything's looking great so far. Um, there are Excel specific options in the read Excel help file. Um, there's, many of them are gonna be about the same. So you have things like column names and do you want to skip and what are the column types and a few other things. Um, but these two options that come immediately after the path in the help file are specific to read Excel and that's because of the way that Excel files are um, structured. So in particular, if your Excel file has multiple sheets, if you have a workbook that's got like Excel spreadsheet one and spreadsheet two and spreadsheet three, you have to specify which sheet you want to draw information from. Um, and you can also specify the range of values that you want to import by giving it like from column B entry six to column uh, F entry 83. You can be a little bit more specific in read Excel about which cell values you want to read in using the, the range option here. And we don't have to worry about that for this data set, um, but maybe just for the sake of argument, let's take a look at what would happen. If we said I want to read in, uh, I'm gonna have to remind myself how the range option works. Here I'm sort of scrolling down into the Excel spreadsheet, sorry, the read Excel help file. 
and seeing what the range option is supposed to be structured. And here it's saying, if I wanted to read in C1 to E7 in a particular data set, this is the structure I would use. So let's just check what happens if I want to read in, say, A1 to F7. I want to read in just this little small little data rectangle. A1, what did I say to F7? Uh, range equals, I'm checking again, what does that um, example indicate I should be specifying? And let's say A1 to F7. That was not at all right. All right, A1 to F7, great. I'm, I'm reading in like a sub table here. This can be helpful. We'll see an example in, in a later video where it is. Um, but the read Excel then gives me at least some options for how I want to read in some of this information. All right, the next one that I'm going to use just to sort of show uh, how this works is to read in something from SAS instead. So let's read in a SAS file. Uh, and this I'm gonna call my pulse data frame. And here I need to use, again, a function from another package. And for the same reason, um, again, I, I could probably use the package two colon function notation, but just to be clear, I'm gonna load this entire package. I am looking at the Haven package. And to read in this data set, I need to use read SAS. This is a SAS file, same kind of a structure from my current working directory, from my project root folder, go into data and read in the public pulse data set, SAS data set. And let's just sort of take a look here. Pulse DF. Great. It's, I mean, at this stage, it's sort of giving me things that I would expect it to give. It's giving me a tibble. It's not printing out very much at all. It's giving me the first 10 rows as always out of a 1087 by seven data frame. Um, it's reading in ID as double, age as double, sex here as character, and the remaining things, uh, BDI score underscore BL, BDI score underscore zero one in, each of those are, are treated as a number. And I probably would, if I were actually going to do some additional work on this, I would probably clean up the names using janitor clean names. For now, since our main goal is to talk about data import, maybe I won't do that. Um, but that's sort of, that's at least how I would read in this data set. And there are similar arguments in read SAS as there are in, in general in some of the other ones. So let me knit this, make sure everything knits. I'm gonna close the MLB data set. Uh, let's commit. Uh, this is reading in an Excel and SAS files. Um, you can read in things from other languages, SPSS, I've come across from time to time um, using the Haven package. Uh, but these are, these are going to get most of the stuff that we need to get done done. Um, in, in the last minute, couple of minutes of this video, what I'm going to talk about is uh, comparison with base R, right? So I've mentioned we are not using functions to import data that exist in R as you, as you install it. You have to load the tidyverse package first, or you have to at least load the reader package to access the read underscore CSV function. Now, what I want to see is like, what about, uh, let's say, what about read.csv? Why am I using read underscore CSV instead of read.csv? Again, read.csv is built into R, it comes, you don't have to load any packages, anything like this, um, but I'm gonna encourage you, or encourage isn't quite strong enough of a word, you should just never, 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 never use read.csv and always, always, always use read underscore CSV. Um, and the differences here are relatively small, um, but let's, let's sort of take a look at what might happen um, when we're doing something like this. So what I'm gonna do is import um, I'll say the stick with the, the litters data set. I'm going to read this in using reader, um, the read underscore CSV, and I'm going to read this in using base R using read.csv. So let's do litters uh, base is read.csv, same structure, uh, data FAS litters.csv. Run that line of code. Things are great. Um, and I'm going to modify this a little bit. This is reader and I'm going to change this to an underscore not a dot and let's just sort of take a look 
at what the differences between these two things are. So what if I look at litters base? Um, the first thing that we're gonna notice is that it is printing out more information. In fact, it is by default going to print the entire data set. Um, and it's gonna give me some weird stuff going on in the column names. It's translated some things from spaces to dots. It's gotten rid of the, what used to be an at and made it an extra dot. Um, just to be clear again, the litters reader version is gonna be at least a little bit more uh, easy to manage when I when I take a look at this, right? So it's going to tell me I've got 39 more rows, and here it's telling me I've got one more variable pup survive sort of off to the side over here, right? So it, at the very least, um, the base R version is going to be a little bit more difficult to take a look at after you have read this in the first time. So the printed difference between these two data sets, between the one that comes out of reader and the one that comes out of base is probably the most obvious difference between the two of them. Um, and some of the other benefits that come from using read underscore CSV versus read dot CSV, believe it or not, have changed in the last very recent um, implementations of R. So, so some of the stuff that we don't have to worry about for now, but how um, things that look like characters get parsed and whether or not you can use incomplete variable names in a variety of settings. Some of that has changed in the most, most recent version of R, largely in response to a recognition that this read underscore CSV was making some good decisions and some good design practices. That said, the additional benefits of using read underscore dot CSV, you won't see in a data set that's about this size, um, but they exist and they're sort of real in the sense that it's often faster. It's a little bit more consistent with the way that um, tibbles have been implemented elsewhere in the tidyverse. And that's important for reasons that um, show up in, in generally small ways, but that do matter. Um, and so I, you know, I encourage you in general to use, encourage, like I say, is maybe not strong enough of a word. I think you really should be using read underscore CSV rather than read dot CSV. And you'll see read dot CSV, especially in, in settings where people have sort of become accustomed to using base R rather than, rather than the tidyverse. So let's knit this uh, and commit both of these two things. So let's say uh, this is uh, read dot CSV versus read underscore CSV and use read underscore CSV. Okay. Now the last, as I said, we're, we're getting down to the very end of this video. The very last thing that I want to point out is something that can be useful. And that's instead of importing data, that's exporting data. Now, most of the time you are not just going to read in a data set and then immediately re-export that data set. Um, but it does come up every now and then you have done some analysis, you've got some small table, you want that to be exported to a CSV, or you've done some amount of data manipulation, you've done like a long data cleaning process, and you want the results of that data cleaning process to be exported as some intermediate result. And so what we're gonna to use to do this sort of a thing is not read CSV, it's going to be write CSV. Um, and we're just gonna demonstrate this really quickly. So export the MLB sub table, All right? So if we just sort of remind ourselves, what is the current version of the MLB DF? It's the small six by six table, right? It's not, it's not the full data set. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is instead of importing, I'm going to write CSV. And now I have to tell this two things. First, I have to tell write CSV, what is the thing that I actually want to export? And then I have to give some path to where that file should be exported. So what I want to export here is my MLB DF. And the path that I want to give it is, I'm going to put this into my data folder, and I'm going to call this MLB subtable.csv. Okay. And if I come over now, I've got my MLB XLSX file with a full data set, and I've got an MLB subtable. Right? Again, I, this, this is a very contrived example, but it gives you some idea about how you might export data. And just for the sake of completeness, I am gonna knit this and commit all of it, uh, writing CSVs, fantastic. Um, and with that, I'm pushing everything to GitHub so everything is online. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and end this lecture. Thanks very much for following along.